Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we ask you please find your seats so we can start the program. Please find your seats. We'll begin momentarily. Is that cough? stage, Western Reserve Land Conservancy trustee, Craig White. Good morning. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, attending this event this morning. On behalf of the Scott and Julie Mawaka Foundation, the Colleague Companies, the Western Reserve Land Conservancy, and our corporate partners, welcome to the first ever Rock in the LLC event. Give yourselves a hand, please. My name is Craig White, and I have the privilege of being the incoming chair of the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. Later in our program, you'll hear from our current chair, Mitchell Snyder, and our president, Rich Cochran. Uh, but for now, I want to thank you for joining us to celebrate our collective efforts to reforest our city. Your presence here today is key to our building awareness of the need to restore our tree canopy. You will hear today about how trees are an important part of our ecosystem and the relationship between the health of our tree canopy and the health of our community. I'm born and raised in Cleveland, and I've traveled about the country in my younger years and continue to do so today. 
I, I, in those previous years, I, I quickly became aware that Cleveland was known across the country as the forest city, full of lush, tree-lined communities, and a very vibrant community at that. But over time, disease, poor maintenance, and perhaps a bit of indifference reduced the importance of trees on the various civic and government agendas. Today we see the results. Places that are devoid of trees often are also places where poverty, crime, and poor living conditions are rising. But the one thing I know about Cleveland is that once we have recognized a problem or a challenge, we are better than anywhere else in the country in dealing with it. Through commitment, determination, innovation, and sheer grit. We do it better than Boston, Austin, Chicago, or even Silicon Valley, and tonight, Denver. <laughs> this morning, you'll hear from a number of leaders who will make the case of the importance of restoring our tree canopy. And they'll tell you what their teams are doing uh, and what each of our organizations, and more importantly, each one of us individually, can do to create a brighter and healthier future of Cleveland. So before we invite them up, we would like to share with you a short video produced by our presenting sponsor, the Collette Companies, about the Western Reserve Land Conservancy and our partners and our efforts collectively to reforest our city. Hi, Thank you. I'm Matt Collins. I'm so excited to share an inside look at one of the leading land conservation organizations in the country, Western Reserve Land Conservancy. Not only do they permanently preserve natural areas and restore them into thriving communities, cities, and habitats, but they partner with educational-based programs for children and the community. Let's hear more about Western Reserve Land Conservancy. Western Reserve Land Conservancy is a regional nonprofit conservation organization. By regional, we mean we work from the Pennsylvania line over to the Sandusky Bay, as far south as places like Canton and Worcester. Western Reserve Land Conservancy has conserved over 66,000 acres of land and more than 805 properties. It has been an organization that has merged with about a dozen other land trusts to really come together and create this conservation story and the impacts that we have had. One differentiation what makes Western Reserve Land Conservancy unique among other land trusts in the nation is the work that we do in cities. Most land trusts protect natural areas and create green spaces for parks and other conserved areas. Some focus on agricultural lands as well. Many do not focus on all three, and that's what makes us unique and special. You know, as we studied the city of Cleveland, we started doing our urban conservation work. One of the first things we realized, it's really denuded. It went from a 50% tree canopy in some neighborhoods down to maybe 10% now. It's really an unbelievable loss of tree canopy. We were known as the forest city for decades. We had one of the best urban forests, but since the 1950s, we've let that decline. Reforest Our City is a program we launched in 2015 to jumpstart the reforestation of the city of Cleveland. We host a number of community activities where we teach people how to plant trees, how to care for trees. We call them tree stewards. We conduct tree giveaways in areas where there are low canopies. We register people who want to plant trees and we'll take care of them and then report back to us on the health of those trees. So we're reforesting the forest city. We're buying old landfills and converting them into landmark parks and preserves. Land conservation and restoration is important for one simple reason, which is all living things are ultimately a reflection of their aggregate environmental conditions. So this makes our mission vitally important to all the living things in the region, in particular to human beings. We have millions of human beings living in this region. The more we can raise the bar on environmental condition health, the healthier those people are, the healthier those communities are, and you create what's known as a positive feedback loop, and you really have a self-sustaining system then. So Elizabeth, thanks for having us out here. This is a great event. So tell us what we're doing out here. We're out today planting trees in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood, and the reason we're doing this is because planting trees improves the tree canopy and helps folks live in a more healthy, vibrant community. 
So Elizabeth, why are partnerships so important to Western Reserve Bank Conservancy? We could not do this work alone. On a site like this, we work with neighborhood organizations. We've talked to residents about what they want to see here in their neighborhood. We work with the city of Cleveland. There are multiple partners that are involved in a tree planting on one site in a vacant lot. The relationship with Western Reserve Land Conservancy is important, number one, because we've been a part of the community for 140 years. And since 1880, Davy's been in and around the Cleveland area. So we live here, we work here. We want to be a part of people that make a difference difference in Northeast Ohio. We are a company that focuses on giving back and what better way to give back than in tree maintenance and planting. So it's a great fit for us and a great way to give back to the community. So how many tree planting events like this uh, does Western Reserve Land Conservancy do uh, every year? We do about 10 to 12 tree plantings a year. We plant in the fall and in the spring. And we also do uh, some yard tree giveaways. We do three to four of those a year where residents of Cleveland can sign up to get two free trees for their yard. If people are interested in our mission and, and helping us or getting involved, they can do a few things. One is they can go to our webpage and learn about you know, volunteer opportunities, all, all of our programs, how to get involved, etc. Donations appreciated too. You can do that online or by calling. So there are probably a hundred different avenues for people to get involved and support our work. We really have a broad range of things where people can dig in, either learn more or get more involved personally. and gentlemen, please take the next few moments to enjoy your breakfast. Our program will recommence shortly.
Gentlemen, please welcome Scott and Julie Mawaka to the stage. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? Sounds like it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Scott Mawaka, and this is my wife, Julie Mawaka. Uh, Uh, we founded and operate the Milwaukee Foundation. Uh, we established it back in 2004. Uh, our purpose has always been to link philanthropy and our community through charitable events. Uh, another word for charitable events is a party. Uh, we enjoy our friends, our family, and our community, and we like to create fun ways for all of those people to get together and do good for our community. Uh, <clears throat> since 2004, either through our own events uh, or through our partnership with Low Pen Charities, the Milwaukee Foundation has given over $2 million to uh, area charities, uh, most of which are exclusive to the Northeastern Ohio community. It's a big part of what we do. It's important to us that our efforts uh, give back to our backyard. Uh, about four years ago, uh, I was in a position where I was looking for a piece of land for outdoor recreation. And our lifelong friends who are here today, Jane and Fritz Neubauer, if you could wave somewhere. Well, they're here somewhere. I see them. All right. Uh, Jane is uh, on the board of trustees and suggested that I look at the inventory of Western Reserve Land Conservancy for this piece of land. And shortly thereafter, we were landowners uh, in partnership with our uh, dear friends Cameron and Katie Mealy. Cameron is also here, uh, and one of our significant sponsors. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, but through that land ownership, we learn more about Western Reserve Land Conservancy, and in particular, this mission, the reforestation of our 
community and our city, uh, Rock and Clee. Uh, from that, we spent probably close to two years working with the staff of Western Reserve Land Conservancy to create a unique set of events that not only would act as a fundraiser, uh, but would create reach and create an event that we could enjoy. Uh, today is that first step of that, and we welcome you. Uh, we certainly look forward to Saturday evening as well for those of you who will be there. Uh, we have a great show, uh, including a Grammy award-winning artist train, so we're very excited by that. Uh, so many people to thank, uh, and I, I hate to miss anybody, but we would like to recognize all of the staff at Western Reserve Land Conservancy who work with us on these programs. I can honestly say in 17 years, we haven't been more overwhelmed with the, the quality, the professionalism, and the character of the group that we worked with. They're phenomenal. Uh, and we look forward to whatever our future holds, whether it's an event similar or something else. But uh, the Morocco Foundation is with you. You guys are one heck of a group. Uh, certainly want to thank uh, the panel of speakers that will be up here shortly. Uh, they will be properly introduced in, in a short moment, but they are... Uh, community leaders uh, in our sports community, and uh, we're just grateful to have them, and I thank them for, for committing their time to be here with us this morning. Uh, my close friends, Matt Collig and Tim Klepper from Collig Companies, uh, they were the first group I reached out to when we decided to uh, produce this event, and we have had the chance to do many things together socially, civically and philanthropically, and you guys are absolute leaders in this community. Uh, you're role models for many of us, and I couldn't be more proud to have you as my friends and to see what you're doing for our city and our community. Uh, when I asked them to step up in a more significant way, uh, there wasn't a hesitation. And they've done everything they can, not only financially, but uh, with all of their resources uh, to make this what it is and to make it special. I'd also be remiss not to mention Stacy Langle, who I know is here, uh, incredibly talented, and thank you uh, for what you did as well to make this what it is. Uh, all of our sponsors, uh, I don't think I could read them all, but they're on all of these placards around. Uh, I asked all of you uh, to... Uh, increase your participation this year financially and with your time and it's been crazy the kind of support we've had uh, all of our friends our business peers that are here thank you you are so amazing and most importantly our families who just have supported us from the beginning uh, Many of you have done 17 years with us. It's amazing. And all of you have stepped up this year to a higher level. We are so grateful. We thank you. We are very excited by what's in front of us. And we hope you enjoy these events. Thank you very much. Round of applause for all of you. <clears throat> I think you had a speech, Julie, or? Uh, if now I could direct your attention back to the screens, we have a video message that was produced for us from our governor, Mr. Mike DeWine. Well, good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I'm so very excited about this partnership coming together to promote the importance of reforesting the forest city. The Western Reserve Land Conservancy has done such wonderful work over the years to make sure we are leaving a great legacy for our future generations. And now, working with the Browns, the Guardians, the Cavaliers, and the colleague companies, I know that work will continue. Some of you may recall in my inaugural address when I talked about my grandfather, who kept planting trees up until his death in his 80s. 
at that time, I thought, you know, he's never going to see these trees grow and get big. Yet he planted them nonetheless. Now his great-grandson, our son John, taps those very maple trees as he does each year to produce maple syrup. And my father, even at the end of his life, made sure that daffodil bulbs were planted. Knowing full well, he probably would not live to see them bloom the next spring. But he did that nonetheless because he had faith and hope in the future and the beauty of what was yet to be. Even though some of us will never see the benefit of the work we're doing now, we know that future generations will. And nothing exemplifies this more than the planting of trees. Trees are invaluable to building strong, vibrant, and resilient cities. Trees are something that we all take for granted. We don't tend to notice them until they're gone. And for many neighborhoods in Cleveland, particularly those that have historically been underserved, the absence of trees and their many benefits is sadly the norm. Fran and I have long supported initiatives around childhood development and applaud this bold plan to revigorate neighborhoods by making it easier for kids and their families to be physically active outdoors and lead healthier lifestyles. Research shows that nearly one in five children living in the city of Cleveland has asthma. One in five. Additionally, far too many of Cleveland's children suffer from obesity. The work of the Western Reserve Land Conservancy and the Cleveland Tree Coalition is critical to reversing this trend and improving the public health of our most vulnerable populations. Together, these organizations and their staff will be at the forefront of improving our communities and creating a healthy tree canopy for everyone to enjoy. There's an old saying about trees. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. So thank you. Thank you so very much for what you're doing for Cleveland and for Cleveland's people and for Ohio. Uh, now I have the distinct pleasure to introduce the leader and the force and the passion behind Western Reserve Land Conservancy, the President and COO, Mr. Rich Cochran. complex situation here with this phone. <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you, Scott and Julie and everybody, frankly, um, for being here. But as, as Scott mentioned, this has been a multi-year process to get to this point. And without their leadership, we would not be here. If you'll please join me in giving them a hand again. I, uh, I had hoped to reinvent our annual benefit as far back as 2008, and every year we would give it a facelift or improve it somehow or tweak it somehow, but we never really reinvented it until, until this year, and it's so exciting to be here. And for those of you who aren't going Saturday night, um, I'm sorry about that because literally train is our, is our band, so that's going to be a fun night. Um, what I want to do today is share with you some images, maps, and photographs that help tell the story of why trees are not nice to have, but rather they are essential to human life and to all human communities. And before I do that, I just want to echo what Scott said, which is, without our team, our internal team, our staff team led by Stella Dillick and Megan Quinn, None of us would be sitting here right now. They have done a Herculean job of pulling together so much, and I'd like to give them a hand. So 
So this might feel a little awkward with me speaking up here and you looking at the screens, but the screens are going to help you understand the narrative. Um, and I'll be able to advance the slides hopefully from here. The, uh, the map you're looking at shows Northeast Ohio, and that is our service area. It happens to correspond with the primary footprint of the Cleveland Browns, the Cleveland Indians slash Guardians, and the Cleveland Cavaliers, which is wonderful. Um, we actually, when we did a big merger back in 2006 to form West Reserve Land Conservancy, we said our footprint is going to be the footprint of our sports franchises, and it turned out to be so. We've preserved more than 800 conservation projects in that footprint, represented by the sunbursts you see on the screen, and that totals more than 66,000 acres. As part of that work, we're very proud that we've created 180 public parks and preserves. Many of the parks and preserves that all of you enjoy were created by West Reserve Land Conservancy purchasing the property and then transferring it to a public partner. We also work in our rural areas where we help preserve prime soils that are the most productive soils in the world for food and fiber production. We're working with real farmers who make the food that we eat and the fiber that we use to create our economy. And this accounts for the largest economic sector in the state of Ohio. And as you know, we've also launched a major urban revitalization program, which we launched in 2011 in the aftermath of the foreclosure crisis, when Ohio had 100,000 vacant, abandoned, and ownerless homes littering its cities, ruining its neighborhoods, destroying trillions of dollars of wealth and equity that people had built up over decades. And we said, we're going to raise the funds and the resources necessary to remove that toxicity from our neighborhoods. And I'm very proud and very grateful to say we've now raised $950 million to address that problem. Thank you, Jim Rokakis and my colleagues for making that happen. It's not all about um, removing vac vacancy and abandonment and blight, though. It's also about, this is kind of a gritty urban event. I hope you don't mind the sirens. <clears throat> We're not in Moreland Hills. We, uh, we don't just remove the blight. We like to add nutrients to the system. So we will take blighted properties and then convert them into beautiful properties. We will take landfills and convert them into landmarks, transforming places, healing places, but more importantly, transforming and healing human beings and human communities. This park that you see is in, is in South Akron, very distressed neighborhood. We have watched this neighborhood blossom and bloom around this tiny 10-acre park that we built for the last 10 years. It is an amazing experience. What was once PCBs and dioxins is now this beautiful park and the people have been transformed by the transformation of the land that serves them. I think maybe the most profound project we've ever worked on is the Garden of 11 Angels. These photographs show Imperial Avenue near 123rd Street on the east side in Mount Pleasant. This is where the serial killer Anthony Sowell lived and where he killed at least 11 women during the foreclosure crisis and it was discovered as the foreclosure crisis was ending. And from that dystopian era in Cleveland's east side history, we now have this beautiful phoenix rising out of the ashes of that crisis, the Garden of 11 Angels. We took these eight parcels outlined in red and have turned them into an incredible community asset, honoring the lives of those 11 women and bringing hope and health to this neighborhood. By the way, that park will be opening in about two weeks to the public. We're having a grand opening. I believe it's November 6th. A lot of people have asked me, why do we do this work? Why do we improve environmental conditions and restore environmental conditions and preserve healthier and healthier environments? And it's really because there are two laws of biology that govern all life. And we learned about these laws of biology and figured out how we could apply them to day-to-day -day life. The first law of biology, that this governs everything from single-celled organisms up to human beings and everything in between, is that all living things are actually a reflection of their aggregate environmental forces, the aggregate predominant environments that they encounter every day, not of some emergent property like, like a gene. Genes, of course, are important, 
but the environmental determinants actually govern the expression of our genes. And the second law, very simple, this is how we stay alive. All living things naturally and subconsciously move away from anything they perceive as toxic and towards anything they perceive as a nutrient. That first law of biology is kind of hard to understand when you're a human being because as one of my trustees once said to me, you know, we're unique among all living things. We shape our environments. I mean, just look around us. We've shaped an entire city here. And he's right. We do shape our environments. But as you'll learn as we go through the remarks today, once we shape them and choose to live in them, they shape us. And I'll tell you the story of my friend David Strong, who grew up on this street in East Cleveland in the 1970s. He was born in 1969. David uh, did not come from wealth. David uh, was a young black man in East Cleveland who slept on a mat on the floor on Howard Avenue, which basically no longer exists. This is what Howard Avenue looks like today. David was a gifted basketball player and was recruited to come to university school in ninth grade in the fall of 1983 and we became good friends. I happened to be in ninth grade at university school that year as well. And after about two weeks, David came up to me and said, Rich, will you help me with this geometry problem? I can't figure it out. I'm embarrassed to ask the teacher during, during the first problem set. I said, of course. We started working through the problem and I realized David couldn't do long division. He couldn't even get to the geometry part of the problem. No one had ever taught David long division and here he was in ninth grade viewed at Kirk Middle School in East Cleveland as the most gifted student and the most gifted basketball player, such a distressed environment that nobody had ever bothered to teach him long division. All of a sudden, he finds himself in this environment. I showed him how to do long division. He was very bright. It took him about 30 seconds to figure it out. And what was not surprising was David went on to become our best basketball player by far. But what was surprising, perhaps, is that by 12th grade, David was helping me with calculus problems. I was no longer helping David with anything. He was helping me with calculus problems. David then went to Johns Hopkins, where he was also a basketball star and an academic star. He's now an ER doctor in Boca Raton, Florida. And I said to my trustee who had pushed back on me about this law of biology and said, we're, we're exempt from this law. I said, what was different about David between 1983 when he didn't know long division would have been called stupid by the public. In 1987, when he was helping me with calculus problems. In 1988, when he was getting straight A's at Johns Hopkins. In 1992, when he was almost first in his class in med school. What was the difference? Was it his genes? No, his genes didn't change. The only thing that changed was his daily environmental conditions. That is the only thing that changed, and he changed before our very eyes. I wish she could help me right now advance the slides. There we go. The second law of biology that governs how we live <clears throat> successfully or unsuccessfully is we all move towards nutrients and away from toxins. This is literally how we stay alive. I first read about this in a biology study that took bacteria, put them into a petri dish. All of the bacteria went to the nutrients and went away from the toxicity, except for the biologist wrote, a few were stranded between the edge of the petri dish and the toxicity and couldn't get away from it. And he wrote something like they were kind of staggering around with their flagella waving, trying to get away from the toxicity, but unable to. As soon as I read that, I thought of the story of Cuyahoga County. In 1950, the map on your left, we had 1.4 million people in Cuyahoga County. 950 plus thousand of them lived in Cleveland. 400,000 of them lived in the inner ring suburbs, and then the rest of the county was basically rural. Today, we have fewer than 380,000 people in Cleveland, fewer than 1.25 million people in the county, and yet we occupy the entire county, and really what happened was that county is a big petri dish where every living thing that could went out to where the nutrients were in the form of fresh air, fresh water, beauty, trees, and away from perceived toxicity, bad air, bad water. We all know that the fire on the Cuyahoga River gave rise to the Clean Water Act. We also had bad air quality in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. A lot of bad things. And by the way, what gets rid of bad air and bad water better than anything? 
trees. It's no coincidence that our tree canopy went from 50% to 18% during this exact time frame. So what do we do about it? What we've realized is that in the absence of relative environmental equality or equity, there will never be human equality or equity. What we've realized is that when we shape our environments, when we make decisions to shape our environments, what we're really doing is shaping ourselves and our children. So how do we shape our cities to be healthier, to nurture our children and our adults? How do we go from the image on the right to the image on the left? And our original hypothesis back in 2011 was parks. We need more parks. There have been thousands of studies on the value of parks. But in 2013, we read this article, which said tree canopy density determines where the wealthy people live and where the poor people live. This was a study of the whole Washington, D.C. area. And what they learned was wherever there are trees, wealthy people live. And wherever there are no trees, poverty is concentrated. That same year, we read this study that showed epidemiologists were able to show that when tree canopies were lost due to emerald ash borer taking out entire suburban canopies, there was a 10% increase in human mortality due to cardiovascular and respiratory disease. The next year, Seattle published a similar study. Not only was wealth and poverty concentrated based on trees, but psychological health and other human health measures, property values, everything got better in the presence of trees and everything got worse where there were no trees. In the most staggering study I've ever read last year in Belgium, 600 children were studied by biologists, sociologists, and scientists. They isolated for one factor, which was daily exposure to greenness. Where are these kids walking to school, walking to their grandmothers, walking to the store? What's the tree canopy like? And for every 3% increase in daily exposure to tree canopy, there was a 2.6 IQ point increase. Literally, across the board, they isolated for race, for wealth, for gender. They even included twins in this study to isolate for genetics. And sadly, here we are with an 18% tree canopy and we're going in the wrong direction. We're losing 100 net acres per year of trees in the city of Cleveland alone. You can actually see certain municipal lines from Google Earth. If you look at the circled uh, yellow circle there, that's the border between Shager Heights and the east side of Cleveland. It goes from gray to green, literally on the municipal line, which is a jagged line. And you can see the tree line itself is jagged as well. We looked at child poverty concentrations, 100% of it concentrated where there are no trees. We looked at lead poisoning in children, 100% of it concentrated where there are no trees. And I want to add, we're not saying that if we had a better tree canopy, all of our societal problems would go away. That would not happen. But what we are saying is, in the presence of trees, all of these things get better. And in the absence of them, they all get worse. Trees are not nice to have. Trees are essential human infrastructure. Trees are essential to human health. And while they don't solve everything, no, there is no silver bullet. Let's be honest with each other. There's no silver bullet. But trees are foundational. They make everything better, and their absence makes everything worse, especially in cities. And as I mentioned, we're on a bad glide path. We're losing 100 acres a year in our current system. And when Western Reserve Land Conservancy realized all this and put it all together, we said, look, teamwork makes the dream work. We need to build a team. We need to build an army of people who understand this, who care about people, and who want to change things, who want to make our city better. We launched our Reforest Our City program. We then helped to establish the Cleveland Tree Coalition. These nine organizations comprise the executive committee of the Cleveland Tree Coalition. I'm very honored to serve as chairman of that executive committee. We are honored as an organization to serve as the home of the Cleveland Tree Coalition. And my colleague Elizabeth is the chairwoman of the larger, what we call the member group, which is 40 or 50 enterprises that comprise the larger member group of the coalition. That coalition has already raised many millions of dollars to address this issue. We are going to raise at least $100 million to address this issue. 
And if I'm being honest, we need to raise, we think, at least 350 to 400 million over the next 10 to 20 years to really put a dent in this problem. And I'm going to finish with this little anecdote. If you look at this picture, this is how I grew up walking to school in Cleveland Heights. It was almost like a nature expedition every morning. There were beautiful elm trees and ash trees and oak trees. There were rock gardens, hostas blooming in August and September, <clears throat> maybe hydrangeas. And we often had a pack of us walking through what felt like the woods. We showed up at school ready to learn. I drove down from Shaker Heights to here today, and this is how the kids walk to school on the east side of Cleveland. Forget about trees. There's not even a tree lawn. It's an unforgiving environment. And my wife, who's a pediatrician, has explained to me what happens when you walk to school in an environment like this, or like this, even the side streets don't have trees. This is in Mount Pleasant. You have a stress response. You have a fight or flight response. And what happens, that's a subconscious thing that we developed when we had to get away from tigers and bears when we evolved. The stress response, the fight or flight response, what happens is, the prefrontal cortex, the seat of learning, is disabled. All of the blood is preferentially sent from your seat of learning to your seat of aggression, the rear brain, your seat of reactivity, so that you can either run or fight effectively. You don't have time to think when you're running or fighting. The other thing that happens is your immune system is shut off because it's too energy intensive. Your digestive system, all of the visceral organs are shut off. All of that blood is sent to the thighs, the buttocks, the biceps, so that you can either run or fight. Kids are literally being disabled by an ancient evolutionary response to stress on their way to school, on their way to their grandmothers, on their way home from school. As opposed to a mile away on Cottage Grove, not a wealthy street in Cleveland Heights. As opposed to a mile away in Shaker Heights on Broxton Road, where they're walking like I did in Cleveland Heights as a kid, through a little nature expedition, showing up at school ready to learn, nurtured by their environmental conditions. It's no wonder that there is a quarter of a century difference in life expectancy between those two neighborhoods. And I'll just finish by reminding you, we all think that we are independent forces in many ways. I felt that way for many years myself, controlling our health outcomes as individuals. But the reality is, we're all a reflection of our predominant environmental conditions. In the absence of environmental equality, there will never be human equality. And what I'll just end with is saying, all of us know that the secret of our futures are hidden in our daily routines. And if your daily routine, oop, you, don't, can't see, you can see the one picture though, before on the left versus the right. If your daily routine is walking down Chester, and being scared by big trucks every morning, or your daily routine is walking on a tree-lined street just a mile away, you're going to have very different outcomes. And I just want to take my hat off to all of you, number one, for being willing to listen to this and learn and consider what I'm sharing with you, but number two, for helping us to make our city a more just, a more healthy, a more fair place. All we ever want as human beings is a fair playing field. We don't want to see unfair playing fields. And this is where we can come together as a community and make a huge difference for the children and the adults who live in the city of Cleveland today. Thank you. What we're going to do now is um, welcome our panelists up, and that'll take a one minute uh, transition. Um, and I'll introduce them once everybody's up here. Thank you. All right, hopefully everyone's microphone works. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel, and then, and then we'll um, 
pose some questions. Uh, on, the, on the far left, we have uh, Tim Klepper, the president and CEO of Colleague Companies. And um, obviously, if you don't know this, they are major NASCAR owners and uh, fit the sports theme. Welcome, Tim. <laughs> Next to Tim is uh, Len Komorowski, the CEO of the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team. Welcome, Len. Matt Colleg, the executive chairman and owner of Colleg Companies and Colleg Racing. Good job, Matt. Paul Dolan, the CEO and owner of the Cleveland Indians, and I guess soon to be Guardians. And Dee Haslam, the managing and principal partner and owner of the Cleveland Browns football team. Dee. I want all of us to take a moment and send lots of healing vibes to the Browns. I've never heard of 20 injured reserve things in my life. Sorry, D. <laughs> we can do it. Well, let's start with D. Uh, D, we're so grateful for your support of our reforest reforestation efforts. And I'm just curious, where does your passion for the environment stem from? Yes. I can. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm from Tennessee, and and I was raised at the in Knoxville, Tennessee, at, at literally at the, on the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So I learned pretty early how important nature and parks were because we spent so much time there. And as I grew older, I got involved in kind of the conservation efforts. So right now, we literally live on the edge of the park in Wallen, Tennessee, when we're not here in Cleveland, we're, we're, we're right there. So, so I so appreciated um, being outside, being part of nature and how important it was. So when we moved up here and I learned about the Land Conservancy, um, I understood about the Metro Parks and how incredible they were, and then just the efforts for clean water and how important the environment was up here. Uh, it was a great connection, and we, of course, moved right on the water um, in Bratton all because it's just so incredibly beautiful here and just how incredibly important it is. And what I really loved about the Land Conservancy is is how we, we work in fighting barriers for education, and what I learned about the efforts of the Land Conservancy and, and what you talk about is, is your efforts to, to really fight the inequities in our neighborhoods. So we were really excited to make that connection. Thank you, Dee. And you also live next to a park in Bratnall. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. <clears throat> Matt, let's jump to you. First of all, thank you again for your sponsorship. It's deeply appreciated. Um, what inspires your companies and you personally to join this important program? Well, first of all, we do, um, we want to do as much as we can for Northeast Ohio. So you guys know that even with our charitable giving programs, I mean, we've given to over 100 501c3 organizations uh, uh, this year. So uh, I, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's really important, especially, you know, even everything we're learning, everything you, went, you just went over um, is just really important to the community and the environment, and, uh, and we're just proud to be a part of it. The other thing, and I got to be honest, I mean, I own a uh, leaf filter gutter protection, okay? And so we, we literally protect the leaves and debris and everything from the gutters. So when I heard there's an organization that are putting trees up literally all over the town, uh, I was all in. So I'm all in. Let's go. That's wonderful. There's a saying for that. Um, Something like enlightened self-interest. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. All right, let's jump to Paul. Paul, we know that environmental justice is an important reason for the Cleveland Indians and Guardians um, and, and how you wanted to get more involved in urban reforestation. Can you share more about your interest in environmental justice? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, hearing the name Guardians, uh, more today than I think of pretty, I'm still getting used to that, but it's really the journey to that name that kind of takes us to where we're at on this. 
Um, you know, when we made the decision to change our name, you know, immediately we started to look to names that resonated in Cleveland that reflected our history, and it doesn't take long to come to the name Forest City. And there was a baseball team in town a gazillion years ago known as the Forest Cities. Um, it didn't work because, like, the Buckeyes was already taken and Forestman doesn't work. But it really didn't work because we really are no longer the Forest City. I mean, you provided the data. You know, we went from a 50% canopy cover down to an 18% canopy cover. It, it would be like, uh, you know, like Pittsburgh um, was trying to develop a new football team today. Steelers made sense in the 30s, but it doesn't make sense today. They would be the robots or the Google boys or something like that. Um, you can change your economy, but when you lose your trees, there's no substitute for that. You know, concrete and, and, and stone don't, don't work. Um, and what we've, you know, what we began to see as we understood, as we do dove into this more, was that it's not just a, a beautification thing. It's not how things look. You talked about it in your keynote address. The impact of losing trees um, is, is felt, you know, most hard on, on on the people who live in the community, and particularly the young people who live in the community. Um, and that's where, frankly, the term environmental justice, which I probably never heard a year ago. And really, we didn't think about it as a term, but now, now, be, now resonates with us very well because you see that impact. So we, you know, we're looking to do something in this area. It's an interesting time for our franchise, you know, new brand, new lease. You know, we're looking to the next century. And in addition to the things that we and others here do, we're looking to do something that may not resonate for another 20, 30, 40 in a century, but we need to start today to do it. And, and that's why we're here today. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Paul. All right, let's go to Len. <clears throat> Len, the Cavs have been dedicated to bringing more trees to Cleveland for many years now with the Trees for Threes program that, that we um, partnered with you on years ago. And uh, we know you're especially committed to creating a vibrant downtown Cleveland as well and fostering economic development. Can you explain how trees are part of that vision for the Cavs and for you? First of all, uh, Rich, uh, thanks. Uh, a shout out to Davey Tree, Pat Covey, Sandy Reed. Uh, Trees for Threes is back. Uh, you know, expect to hopefully if La Lowry Markinen and team can shoot a lot of threes this year, we'll hope to have about a thousand trees planted from that program. Uh, and of course, you know, in our history, we had a, a player who was so dedicated. His name was actually Tree Rollins, if you recall. But. Uh, a vibrant down, you know, uh, uh, another big shout out to you, Rich. Uh, you've been a great partner. We worked with you, as you recall, worked the hardest hit funds, securing about 66 million for blight removal. And once, once you remove the blight, then what comes up out of that? And obviously our tree canopy and growing up personally in Pittsburgh, which has a relatively strong tree canopy, it's very stark. I know it's not a, a good thing to admit here uh, as far as Pittsburgh part, but <laughs> it's it, the uh, tree canopy and, and is something that creates a vibrant a vibrant destination and for all of our event activity coming down here having a barren downtown you know does not create the type of live work and play environment that attracts people to want to be there for the for the long term thank you Len and it's okay that you're from Pittsburgh we love you <laughs> Tim, let's, let's go to you. Although we're talking primarily about tree plants in the Cleveland area, the scope and reach of college companies can be a valuable addition to raise awareness of the importance of trees across the country. Can you talk a little bit about how that might work? How do I follow Matt? I mean, right? How do I follow that? Being in the leaf business and we're standing up here talking on this panel. Um, you know, the college companies, Matt hit it on the head. I mean, we've we truly believe the ethos of our business is, you know, the more business and, 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 and money we can make as a company, it's really the more money we can give back to the community. And what an amazing, not only here in Northeastern Ohio, but, you know, from coast to coast. And really to hear about what you're doing and what this conservancy is doing with the reforestation of this phenomenal city, which... I went to kindergarten in Hudson, graduated from Hudson High School, uh, and started my first job at McDonald and Company right down the street here. Uh, to have all of this happening right here in our community, we are super excited to be behind it. I really think what's interesting about what we do here is so many of the charities that we get behind 
are in our situation for really sick kids. I mean, if you would think about what we get behind, you're talking about probably 50 to 60 percent of what we get behind is for that. Um, to get behind this and to see it grow not only here but throughout the country, uh, we're really excited for that because we truly believe that if you take your environment, right, and make it better, the outcome of that will be that people's lives will become better. We're huge believers in that. So, you know, we're really thankful to be here today and have uh, the ability to sit and talk through this. And you guys have done an amazing job, so thank you. You deserve a round of applause, frankly. $950 million raised. It's a lot of money. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. And, and so grateful for your support. All right, D, um, I know that you and Jimmy and the Haslam Foundation and the, and the entire Cleveland Browns organization are very passionate about youth. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about um, that commitment to improving our community for, for the children of our community and also for their families? Yes, of course. I mean, so we, we lean to get involved in education and um, looking at the barriers in this community. We, we really started with chronic absenteeism and, and, and work really deeply in that area. There's 380,000 kids in Ohio that are chronically absent right now, so, so it, it just it grew recently. But one of the things um, that I learned through the Land Conservancy is that connection you talked about between academics and um, the environment and, and nature. So this was actually a perfect partnership for us because putting in um, trees in the schoolyards and really focusing on that you will improve attendance. And so we're just incredibly excited about the opportunity to really make a difference in education, but at the same time improve the, improve the environment. So the, you know, the, the studies are there. You talked about what it's like to walk to school and, and, not, and be on concrete instead of trees and the stress it causes. And it's also been shown, the Europe, European study showed that, that kids uh, the study was done for kids 10 to 15 that their IQ, if there's 3%, just 3% more green coverage, that their IQ went up 2.6 points. That's, that's a tremendous leap. So I, I, it becomes really important to us as far as being part of it, education. And one of the things we think about all the time is sports is uni unifies a community. Um, and so does green space. And so especially in um, these areas, these neighborhoods with these schools and these kids, it really does unite a community and, and so impactful for children. Thank you, Dee. I couldn't agree more. And, and actually, that's a great segue to, to ask Paul. Um, I know you and the, and the team have been working on ideas of how you can use your platform to help these kinds of issues. Will you share a little bit about your thinking there and what, what you're thinking of? Yeah. like. Uh, like Dee and the Browns and the, and the Cavaliers, you know, you know, we're focused, you know, on on really the youth of our city, and you know, you know, we try to, you know, education, you know, preparedness for life generally, and and if they can play a little baseball along the way, that would be good. Um, but if they, uh, you know, and you think think of the Lead Safe Coalition that's been around for a while. You know, you know, if a kid goes to school already poisoned because they've they've been exposed to lead, they've got no chance to succeed. The reality is, <clears throat> growing up in a city like Cleveland where the tree canopy has gone down to where it is, you again highlighted all the issues that, that flow from that. You know, if the air they breathe is poisoning them, if the environment they're in because of lack of trees or lack of trees contributed poisons them in some way, they're not going to succeed in life. So yes, we wanna we, we're focusing on young people, but you got to start with the environment that they're growing up in if we're going to be successful helping them in the other areas. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Matt, um, I think in some ways you have a unique perspective among the panelists because um, very recently you and your entire team participated in a tree planting in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood, which for me is a very inspiring experience whenever I do it. I'm curious if you could share your observations and, and what you felt doing that. Yeah, well, that's, that's probably a good way to put it. It's an inspiring. Um, just like most of our organizations uh, that we give to through colleague giving, uh, we want to be like more involved, like more hands-on, not just not just give money. So it was important for us to get out and experience an actual tree planting. And 
you know, you guys saw some of the pictures. We went to one of those neighborhoods that doesn't have any trees whatsoever. And you almost to be able to give that gift back to the community. I mean, it was in like a park, probably the, you know, almost the size of this. And, you know, how many trees do we plant? 15, 30 trees. And, you know, you know, I have a NASCAR team. It almost felt like a pit stop that we were putting, you know, these, these trees, you know, you're putting sticks in the ground and um, planting the trees. There's so much more to tree planting than I ever would have imagined as far as how deep they have to be, how much mulch you have to put around. You have to keep it away, away from the tree, um, you know, so that it doesn't, you know, do something to the bark. And so... I learned so much. I've learned so much about tree. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, but it was a really good experience, and I would encourage people to get out and, and do the tree plantings because uh, uh, it's very inspirational. In fact, I'm going to take, I would like to take my daughter. I have a 14-year-old daughter. She's in eighth grade. I would like to take her uh, to a tree planting just to experience that. You know that a tree is going to be there for maybe not only, you know, decades, but, I mean, maybe hundreds of years. Yeah. So, uh, it feels good. I can't wait even for the next few years to go back to that neighborhood and see what we created. That's wonderful. I can tell you, as a father of three daughters, I've done that with all three of my daughters many times, and it's an amazing experience. And, and speaking of daughters, Len, your daughter actually interned for us and, and worked on our tree program. Can you talk about how that might have influenced either her or you or both? Well, I can tell you it influenced her um, in terms of uh, even career choice. So she uh, had uh, initially thought out she was going to be in the event business, wanted to work in that realm, went to NC State, got her degree in sustainable materials, and is working for a sustainable packaging company right now, which we know plastic, proliferation of plastic, whatever in our environment, just wreaks havoc. And uh, she's actually up in... New Hampshire right now <laughs> working in, in that realm, but she down in the Carolinas working in that front. So truly was an inspiration for her as far as as far as that goes. And then really for us and our you know, starting with our chairman Dan Gilbert, um, it's really about our neighborhoods and the environment that we create there. And with Dan and our team, we just had an announcement yesterday with Rocket Community Fund about uh, helping to bridge the digital divide in Cleveland investment on that realm. But then another added layer will be about home uh, home ownership and promoting home ownership and a key part of that is having a, a setting where you have a tree canopy because we know that home ownership values grow by seven percent in a well treed lot in a forested neighborhood and uh, and so it, it promotes that activity it promotes pedestrian activity people feel safe they can walk that we saw the stark pictures you showed you're, you're more inclined to be walking and, and be, uh, be safe at that part. Parks also attract investment, private investment, to create uh, more wealth and value for, for the neighborhood. So in general, it's a very much a live, work, and play environment that uh, it, it promotes overall. But, uh, but thank you for uh, the opportunity for, for our daughter. And, and uh, now she's on a lifelong path to uh, really promote the cause. That's great. Well, we need millions more of her. And uh, actually, along those lines, I'm kind of hijacking my questions here. But Paul, your boys both interned for us, too. And I, and I think they might have had something to do with your interest in this topic. Can you share how it might have affected either them or you or your wife? Yeah, uh, both of my boys uh, were interns at Western Reserve. And uh, one of them was particularly uh, affected by the experience. Uh, and, and trees were a big part of it. I think he's worked with you folks since then on, on some projects. Um, um, he's on his way to Glasgow in a couple of weeks to save the world, so you can all rest <laughs> easy right now. Um, uh, but but he has been you know highly motivated, and, he, and I've actually talked to him about this initiative over, over the last couple of months, and very excited about that as well. That's great. Um, the the son Paul's talking about his name is Peter, and he actually brought to us what I think will end up being a transformational program idea that we'll tell tell you all more about in the next year or two relative to. Um, carbon credits and in, in, in ap applied to the city context rather than the rural context. So he had a big impact on us too. Well, let me do this. Um, Tim, any final thoughts? I mean, what an awesome morning. Uh, really appreciate uh, being able to be here and learning about, learning even more about just what you're doing here. Um, 
and it's exciting to be a part of that. I just would say that, you know, the way I was raised, um, it's you always put back what you take. You know, if you take something or if you move it, well, damn it, put it back. <laughs> and put it back where it belongs, too. You know, just don't throw it there. Just put it back where it belongs. Uh, that's one thing that I think really resonates with this. And then the other thing is always leave what you found better than when you found it. And to see your work here uh, and, and the fact that you're actually doing that after years of this place just being um, with, with the trees coming down and, and, and literally the, the build out with the different uh, houses and the towns that we are and putting trees back in and leaving it better than we found it. That's awesome stuff and super proud to be around it. Thank you so much, Tim. And Dee, I would like to give you the final word. Any reflections, wow. advice, and, and again, sending lots of healing vibes. That, that, that's a heavy <laughs> lift. I, I think one thing, we're, we're going to be planting trees on November 2nd at Boys and Girls Club at Slavic Village if anybody wants to join us. But I think just getting involved and just really how important just planting trees becomes I think if we can get that word out to everybody, I think it's truly going to make a difference. And then I have to say to this community, um, thanks for all your support, and hopefully everybody will be there tonight and go Browns. Go Browns. <laughs> let's, let's give the panel a, a really loud hand. Thank you so much. We are deeply grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, we have a gift for you, each of you. I'll bring them down to the table okay. later. Um, and then let me introduce our final speaker who's going to bring it home for us. Um, Mitchell Schneider is our board chairman and is also deeply committed to urban revitalization as professional life and personal life. And I couldn't be more grateful to Mitchell for being an amazing inspiration to me and a boss and a person who gives more to this community than anything I could ever imagine. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you, appreciate it. Good morning, every Good morning everyone. I'll be uh, very brief. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here this morning. It's been my honor and privilege to uh, be on the board of this organization for, for uh, coming on 12 years and to have served as its uh, board chairman for the last uh, three and a half years, and uh, watching uh, Rich uh, Cochran and the entire um, Western Reserve Land Conservancy team grow and accomplish uh, the amazing work that they do uh, day in and day out has really been a, an honor and, and, and growth experience for me. So before I go on, I just want to thank uh, Rich and the entire staff uh, for executing this event this morning and for all the work that uh, the Land Conservancy accomplishes an amazing group of people. So thank you. I also want to uh, thank again our panelists, uh, Dee Haslam, uh, Paul Dolan, Len Komorowski, Pat, or Matt Kalig, and Tim Klepper. Uh, really appreciate all of you being out here, but more important than being out here, uh, joining us in our mission to uh, reforest the city of Cleveland and add to this canopy and try to reverse the damage that's been done. Um, so very much appreciate all of your participation and your organizations as well. Uh, as we wind down uh, this morning, I also just want to thank uh, the, the college companies and the uh, Scott and Julie Mwaka and their foundation for their support and would invite uh, each of you to join in and help with this cause. There's pledge cards on your table. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity yet to uh, become a sponsor or to make a commitment to the work that we're doing, and if this morning's events have inspired you to do so, uh, we hope you might um, leave a, a little bit of your indication to do that on the tables this morning. And I thank anyone who does so in advance for so doing. Um, with that, uh, I just want to uh, say what we were planning on doing before we thought it would be raining right now was having a tree planting of a beautiful Higgin cherry tree uh, that's planted in the back and our staff can probably point you to on your way out. 
Uh, we took the uh, liberty of planting that tea before, tree before the event uh, this morning so we didn't have people standing in the rain, uh, but it will be here on Public Square for hopefully decades and decades to come. Uh, all of us that participated in this event this morning uh, can have the opportunity to think back over the coming years and reflect upon um, our participation in really this very public launch of uh, reforesting our city uh, efforts of the Land Conservancy. So uh, thank you all again. Uh, there's probably going to be a bit of a backup on the valley services since we thought people might be um, strolling out throughout the tree planting thing. So please have a little bit of patience on your, on your way out. And um, again, uh, many thanks to everyone uh, that participated this morning. So be well. Thank you.